you will be shocked to discover the truth about the face and skin color of Jesus. Was Jesus really as we have come to know him? The letter that Pilate wrote to Roman Emperor Tiberius about Jesus contains astonishing details about his appearance, details that aren't even mentioned in the Gospels. In this letter he also talks about Jesus' miracles, his trial, crucifixion, and believe it or not, his resurrection. But what exactly does this letter say? What could Pilate have told the emperor about the resurrection of the Son of God and his physical appearance? Pilate begins his letter to Tiberius Caesar the emperor by saying, Greetings, Majesty. The recent events in my province have been so astonishing that I feel compelled to recount everything in detail, as I believe these occurrences may, in the future, impact the fate of our empire. It seems as though all the gods have suddenly turned away from us. I am almost inclined to say that the day I assumed governance of Judea in place of Valerius was cursed, for since then my life has been filled with worries and troubles. As soon as I arrived in Jerusalem, I took over the Praetorium and prepared a great banquet. I invited a tetrarch from Galilee, the high priest, and his officials, but when the appointed time came, no one appeared. I saw this as a sign of disrespect towards my authority and the Roman government. A few days later the high priest came to visit me with a serious yet deceitful expression. He claimed that his religion forbade him from sitting down to eat with Romans, but his face showed that his words were not sincere. Although I accepted his excuse, it became clear to me that he and his followers were opposed to the Romans. I recommend that the Romans remain vigilant of the high priests in this region, as they would not hesitate to betray even their own mothers for power and wealth. Of all the cities we have conquered, Jerusalem is the hardest to control. The people are so rebellious that I live in constant fear of an uprising. I have few soldiers, only a centurion and 100 men under my command. I requested reinforcements from the governor of Syria, but he informed me that he barely had enough troops to protect his own province. Our desire to expand seems to outweigh our ability to protect what we have already conquered. I fear this may eventually lead to the downfall of our government. I have avoided direct contact with the people, fearing what the priests might incite the rebels to do. Still, I have tried to better understand the mindset and concerns of this population. Among the various rumors I have heard, one in particular caught my attention. They spoke of a young man in Galilee, who was teaching a new doctrine in the name of a god who had sent him. At first I thought he might be trying to influence the people against us, but I quickly realized that wasn't the case. Jesus of Nazareth seemed to be more sympathetic to the Romans than to the Jews themselves. Once, as I passed through the square, I saw a large crowd gathered around a young man leaning against a tree, speaking calmly. I learned that it was Jesus which didn't surprise me, as he clearly stood out among those listening to him. I decided not to interrupt with my presence. I continued on my way, but asked my secretary to blend into the crowd and listen to what he was saying. My secretary, Manlius, is the grandson of an old conspirator who waited for Catiline for years in Etruria. He speaks Hebrew fluently, is loyal to me, and has my complete trust. When Manlius returned to the Praetorium, he told me what Jesus had said. I have never seen in the works of philosophers anything that compares to the wisdom of his words. One of the many Jewish rebels of Jerusalem asked Jesus if it was right to pay taxes to Caesar. He replied, Give to Seir what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. That wisdom is what led me to release the Nazarene, even though I had the power to arrest him or send him into exile in Pontus. Doing so would have been unjust, and justice is a fundamental principle of Roman governance. Jesus was not an agitator nor a rebel. I offered him my protection, perhaps without him even realizing it. Jesus had the freedom to act, speak, gather with the people, choose his followers, and teach without any interference from me. If someday, may the gods forbid, the religion of our ancestors is replaced by that of Jesus, it will be this tolerance that may lead to the fall of Rome, and I, as an unfortunate instrument, will have been part of what the Jews call providence and we call fate. This freedom I gave Jesus angered the wealthier and more influential Jews. Jesus was harsh with them, and for me that was reason enough to keep him free. To the scribes and Pharisees he would say, You are like serpents, appearing as well-decorated tombs on the outside but inside you are full of death. On other occasions, he criticized local traditions saying that humility was more valuable in God's eyes than any social status. Almost every day I received complaints at the Praetorium about Jesus' boldness. 
They warned me that something bad might happen to him and that Jerusalem had a history of stoning those who declared themselves prophets. A petition to Caesar was being prepared, but the Senate approved my decisions and promised reinforcements after the Persian War as I didn't have enough troops to contain a potential uprising. I then decided to take action to restore peace in the city without lowering myself. I sent a message to Jesus asking him to come to the Praetorium so we could talk. He came. You know, being of Spanish and Roman origin, I am not easily intimidated or moved. However, when Jesus arrived I was standing on the balcony and I felt as if my feet were glued to the marble floor. My whole body trembled like someone with a guilty conscience while the Nazarene remained calm with a serenity that seemed like purity itself. As he approached, he stopped and with a gentle gesture seemed to say, I am here, without needing to speak a word for a long time. I was both amazed and impressed by this man, a type that our artists have never imagined when depicting gods and heroes. There was nothing about him that repelled me, yet I felt weak and too old to come any closer. Jesus, I finally said, my voice trembling. Jesus of Nazareth, for the past three years, I have given you total freedom of expression, and I do not regret it. Your words are sensible and full of wisdom. I don't know if you've read Socrates or Plato, but I recognize that the simplicity and greatness of your speech place you far above these philosophers. The emperor is aware of this, and as his representative here, I am pleased to have granted you the freedom you so rightly deserve. However, I must warn you that your words have attracted powerful and misguided enemies. Socrates too had enemies and became their victim. Yours even more furious have turned against you for the harshness of your words and against me for allowing you to speak freely. Some even accuse me of conspiring with you to weaken the little civil power that Rome still allows the Hebrews. My recommendation, and not an order, is that you be more careful and moderate in your speech from now on considering that your enemies may use pride to incite the ignorant people against you and force me to act according to the law. Jesus responded calmly, Ruler of the earth, your words do not come from true wisdom. Ask Mount Tabor to stop in the middle of the valley. It will answer that it follows the laws of nature and of the Creator God. Only He knows where the waters flow. I tell you the truth. Before the rose of Sharon blooms, the blood of the righteous will be shed. Your blood will not be shed, I replied, deeply moved. I value your wisdom more than all these rebellious Pharisees who abuse the freedom the Romans have granted them. They conspire against Caesar and defame him, making the people believe he is a tyrant who seeks their destruction. These ungrateful men do not realize that sometimes the wolf disguises itself as it aims. I will protect you from them. My praetorium will be a sacred refuge for you, both day and night. Jesus, calm as ever, shook his head, and with a serene smile said, When the time comes there will be no refuge for the Son of Man neither on the earth nor beneath it. The true refuge is in the heavens, pointing upward. What was written by the prophets will be fulfilled, young man. Worried, I replied, you are forcing me to turn my request into an order. The security of this province which is under my responsibility will be. It demands it. You must be more cautious in your speeches. Do not disregard this order for you know the consequences. May happiness accompany you. Farewell. Prince of the earth, said Jesus, I did not come to bring disturbance but rather peace, love, and charity. I was born on the same day that Augustus Caesar brought tranquility to the Roman Empire. The persecutions are not because of me, but I know I will face many of them due to others, in obedience to my Father's will, who has shown me the path to follow. So. Moderate your words. You have no power to keep the victim on the altar of sacrifice. After saying this, he withdrew like a light fading on the horizon, which brought me great relief, for his presence was too heavy a burden for me. Herod, who ruled at the time and was already of advanced age, joined Jesus' enemies to seek revenge. If it were up to Herod alone, he would have ordered Jesus killed immediately, but despite his vanity as king, he hesitated to do something that might damage his influence with the Senate perhaps like me, he also feared Jesus. But a Roman official could not admit fear of a Jew. Herod came to the Praetorium to visit me, and as he rose to leave after a conversation of little importance, he asked me what I thought of the Nazarene. I responded that Jesus seemed to be one of the great sages who sometimes appear in great nations, and that his teachings were not about politics. Therefore Rome had decided to let him speak freely, 
as his actions did not justify any kind of punishment. Herod gave me a mocking smile and, with a bow full of irony, took his leave. The most important Jewish festival, Passover, was approaching, and there was an intention to exploit the popular unrest that always overtook the city during this time. Jerusalem was crowded with a noisy mob demanding Jesus' death. My informants revealed that the temple's treasury had been used to bribe the people. The danger was near, and a Roman centurion had been publicly humiliated. I sent a letter to the governor of Syria requesting reinforcements, 100 foot soldiers and 100 cavalrymen, but he refused. I found myself isolated with few veterans in a hostile and rebellious city, without the strength to control a possible uprising, and with no choice but to endure it. Jesus was arrested on the charge of being a rebel, although they knew there was no reason to fear the Praetorium. With the support of their leaders, they believed I was covering up the revolt and kept shouting relentlessly, Crucify him! Crucify him! At that moment, three major groups united against Jesus. The Herodians, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. The ambiguous stance of the Herodians and Sadducees seemed to have two reasons. They hated Jesus, but they were also weary of Roman rule. They never forgave me for entering the holy city with banners bearing the image of the emperor. And even though I made a grave mistake on that occasion, to them, the sacrilege was still unforgivable. Another conflict was also intensifying among them. I had suggested that a portion of the temple's treasury be used to fund public works, and this idea was deemed unacceptable by the Pharisees, who were already opponents of Jesus. They cared little about the government and harbored resentment due to the harsh criticisms the Nazarene had been making against them for the past three years in every place he visited. In addition to these groups, I was also dealing with the unruly and reckless populace, always ready to join a rebellion and take advantage of any chaos that might arise. Faced with this, Jesus was brought before the high priest and sentenced to death. At that moment, Caiaphas, the high priest, acted in an apparently submissive manner, sending Jesus to me so that I could confirm the sentence and ensure the execution. I replied that, since Jesus was from Galilee, the case should be judged by Herod, and I ordered that he be taken to him. Herod, displaying false humility and claiming to respect Caesar's representative, sent the decision back to me, placing the entire responsibility in my hands. In no time, my palace became a besieged fortress, with the number of rebels growing rapidly. Jerusalem was overrun with crowds descending from the mountains of Nazareth. It seemed as though all of Judea was gathering in the city. A galaxier, who claimed to foresee the future, fell at my feet in tears and warned me, Beware! Do not touch this man, for he is sacred. Last night I saw him in a vision walking on water, flying on the wings of the wind. He spoke to the storm and to the fish in the lake, and they all obeyed him. I saw the river on Mount Catherine fill with blood, the statues of Caesar weep, and the morning sun appeared like a mourning virgin. If you do not heed your wife's warnings, a great misfortune awaits you. Fear the curse of the Roman Senate. Fear the thrones of Caesar. At that moment, the marble steps of the Praetorium trembled under the weight of the crowd as they brought Jesus back to me. I went to the halls of justice, surrounded by my guard, and firmly asked the crowd what they wanted. The response was unanimous. Jesus' death. What crime has he committed? I asked. He has blasphemed, prophesied the destruction of the temple, and declared himself the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of the Jews. I replied that Roman justice did not sentence anyone to death for such accusations. However, the shouts of crucify him, crucify him echoed through the enraged crowd, causing even the palace walls to shake. Among them all, the only one who remained calm was Jesus. After several failed attempts to protect him from the wrath of his enemies, I made a decision that seemed like the last hope of saving his life. I suggested, as was customary during the festivities, to release a prisoner, and I proposed freeing Jesus. However, the people continued to insist that he be crucified. I tried to argue, explaining that their actions were contrary to their own laws. I reminded them that, according to Jewish law, no judge could condemn a defendant without first fasting for an entire day, and that the sentence required the consent of the Sanhedrin and the signature of its president. In this court, 
No execution could take place on the same day the sentence was passed. The following day, which would be the day of execution, the Sanhedrin was supposed to review the entire process. Furthermore, their law required that a man stand at the court's door with a banner, while another, mounted on horseback, proclaim the condemned man's name, the crime committed, and the names of the witnesses, asking if anyone could testify in his favor. The prisoner, on the way to execution, had the right to return up to three times to present new arguments in his defense. I emphasized these points hoping it would calm them, but the cries of, crucify him, crucify him persisted. I then ordered Jesus to be flogged, believing this would be enough, but it only increased their hatred. I asked for a basin and washed my hands before the enraged crowd, declaring that, in my judgment, Jesus of Nazareth had done nothing deserving of death. However, my words were in vain. Jesus' fate was already sealed. I had witnessed the fury of mobs and civil riots before, but nothing compared to that day. It seemed as if all the spirits from the depths of hell had gathered in Jerusalem. The crowd didn't simply move. They were pushed and spun like a whirlwind surging in furious waves from the gates of the Praetorium to Mount Zion, with shouts and cries louder than any unrest I had ever witnessed in the disturbances of Pannonia or the Forum. The day gradually darkened, like a winter evening, reminding me of what happened at the death of Julius Caesar. Curiously, it was also the Ides of March. As governor of a rebellious province, I stood in a corner of my basilica, watching the grim scene as the innocent Nazarene was led to his execution. Everything around me was deserted. Jerusalem had emptied its people through the dark gates leading to Jamia. An air of sadness and desolation lingered. My soul connected with Calvary while the centurion struggled to maintain order amidst the chaos. I was utterly alone. And a weight on my chest told me that what was unfolding before me was more a drama of the gods than of men. The sounds of agony echoed from Golgotha, carried by the wind as if announcing a suffering never before heard by human ears. Black clouds gathered over the temple and spread across the city, covering it like a dark shroud, with visible signs both in the heavens and on the earth. It is said that Dionysius, the patriarch, exclaimed, either the Creator is suffering or the universe is falling apart. As these frightening phenomena unfolded, a violent earthquake shook Lower Egypt, filling everyone with terror and nearly scaring the superstitious Jews to death. Balthazar, a learned Jew from Antioch and a close friend of the Nazarene, was found dead after the earthquake. Whether his death was caused by the shock or by grief, no one knows for sure. Near the first hour of the night, I wrapped myself in my cloak and descended into the city. Heading toward the gates of Golgotha, the sacrifice had already been consummated and the crowd, still unsettled, was returning to their homes with a somber air of remorse for what they had witnessed. I also saw my small Roman entourage passing silently, visibly shaken, the standard bearer had draped the eagle with a cloth, a sign of mourning. I heard some Jewish soldiers murmuring words I couldn't understand, while others were talking about miracles the Romans used to associate with their gods. At certain moments, groups of men and women would stop and look toward Mount Calvary, as if they were waiting for some kind of sign. I returned to the Praetorium with a heavy heart climbing the stairs still stained with the blood of the Nazarene. I saw an elderly man kneeling in prayer surrounded by Romans who were crying. He threw himself at my feet, sobbing deeply. Seeing an old man cry always gets to you, and my heart, already full of sorrow, became even more burdened. We cried together, and it seemed like everyone there, both him and many in the crowd, were on the verge of tears. I had never witnessed anything like it. Those who betrayed sold out and shouted against him. Those who demanded his crucifixion vanished like cowards. I heard that some of them washed their mouths with vinegar, a reference to what Jesus had said about the resurrection and the separation of the dead. If it happened, it was there in front of that enormous crowd. Father, I asked when I finally composed myself, Who are you and what do you want? I am Joseph of Arimathea, he replied, and I come to ask permission to bury Jesus of Nazareth. I granted him permission and instructed Melius to take some soldiers to ensure the body wouldn't be violated. A few days later the tomb was found empty, and the disciples began to say that Jesus had risen just as he had foretold. This caused even more commotion than his death itself. I cannot say for certain what truly happened, but I thoroughly investigated the matter. 
You can check personally and decide if I made any mistakes as Herod claims. Joseph used his own tomb to bury Jesus, but I cannot guarantee whether he knew or had something planned regarding the resurrection. The day after the burial, a priest came to the praetorium worried that the disciples might steal Jesus' body and make it seem like he had risen as he had predicted. And as they strongly believed, I directed the priest to the captain of the guard, Marcus, and ordered him to place as many Jewish soldiers as necessary around the tomb, so that if anything happened, the responsibility would fall on them and not on the Romans, when I heard the news of the empty tomb. My concern grew. I spoke with Marcus, who told me he had assigned his lieutenant Ben Isham with 100 soldiers to guard the site. He reported that Isham and his men were terrified by the events of that morning. I called for Esham who recounted as faithfully as possible what happened. He said that around the fourth watch, a soft, enchanting light appeared over the tomb. At first he thought it was women who had come to embalm Jesus' body, as was the custom, but he didn't understand how they could have passed through the guards. As he pondered this, the entire place was illuminated, and he saw what seemed like a multitude of the dead in their burial shrouds, all appearing younger and full of joy, while a heavenly music the most beautiful he had ever heard, filled the air. It felt as though the entire sky was praising God. Suddenly the earth began to shake violently and he felt weak, unable to stand, as if the ground was moving beneath his feet, and then he fainted, not knowing what happened after that. I asked him how he was when he came to. He said he was lying on the ground, face down. I questioned if he might have mistaken the light he saw for the sunrise in the east. He replied that at first he thought so too, but at a short distance it was still quite dark, and he remembered it was too early for the sun to rise. I asked if the dizziness he felt could have been from standing up too quickly, which sometimes causes that sensation. He denied it, explaining that he hadn't slept all night, as sleeping during duty was punishable by death. He mentioned that he had allowed some soldiers to sleep at that time, and that some were still asleep. I asked how long the scene lasted. He said he wasn't sure but thought it was nearly an hour until the daylight overshadowed it. I asked if he had gone to the tomb after regaining his composure. He responded that he hadn't, as he was afraid, and as soon as reinforcements arrived they all returned to the barracks. I asked if the priests had questioned him. He confirmed, saying that the priests wanted him to claim it was an earthquake and that the guards had been sleeping. They offered him money to say that the disciples had come and stolen Jesus' body but he said he didn't see any disciples and only learned of the body's disappearance when he was told. I asked him about the personal opinions of the priests he spoke with, and he told me that some believe Jesus was not an ordinary man, not a human being like others, and that he wasn't the son of Mary as many thought. In their view, he was a figure who had already appeared on earth in other times, such as in the days of Abraham and Lot, and on various other occasions and places. If this Jewish theory is correct, these conclusions seem to make sense, as they align with what we know about the life of this man. Both friends and enemies acknowledged that Jesus seemed to have control over the elements, as if he were a potter shaping clay. He turned water into wine, healed diseases, raised the dead, calmed storms, and even made fish appear with coins in their mouths. If he truly performed all these acts, and many others, as witnessed by the Jews themselves, and it was precisely for these reasons that he stirred up so much hostility, it is clear that he wasn't accused of common crimes, of breaking laws or of directly harming anyone. These deeds are known by thousands of people, both supporters and opponents. I'm inclined to believe, as someone said at the cross, truly, this was the Son of God. Pontius Pilate described Jesus as an impressive figure, distinct from any other. He mentioned that Jesus had an average height, with a calm demeanor and a serene presence that drew the attention of everyone around him. His face conveyed a sense of kindness and peace, even in the most tense situations, and his expression always reflected tranquility. Jesus seemed to look at people with deep compassion, as if he understood them in a unique and complete way. Accounts say that Jesus had long, soft hair that fell harmoniously over his shoulders. His hair was slightly wavy and described as light brown, almost blonde, which set him apart from the people of the region. His eyes were perhaps his most remarkable feature, described as deep and piercing. Some said they varied between light brown and blue, depending on the observer's perspective. His eyes conveyed wisdom and kindness, while also showing a firmness that seemed to understand life and the human heart profoundly.
Jesus' skin was described as fair, with a smooth texture, like someone who spent time outdoors but still maintained a healthy and well-kept appearance. His face was considered beautiful and symmetrical, with features that inspired confidence and respect. It wasn't just any face, but one that projected authority without appearing intimidating or threatening. He wore a full, well-groomed beard, which added a touch of maturity and respect to his appearance. Jesus dressed simply, but always with dignity. His clothes, though modest, were always clean and typically consisted of a long robe and a tunic. He did not wear flashy adornments or jewelry, reflecting his detachment from material possessions. His appearance conveyed a message of humility and simplicity, even with his striking presence. Without needing to speak, he could transmit a sense of peace and welcome. Now, noble sovereign, this is the most accurate account I can provide of the events. I have made every effort to present all the details so that you may judge my conduct fairly, knowing that much criticism has been directed at me in this matter. With loyalty and respect to my sovereign, I remain your most obedient servant. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe to the channel right now. Click on the video appearing on your screen to discover more mysteries like this,